For those who are joining us online, we'll begin in a few moments. Mm-hmm. It's fine. Sure. Oh, yeah. That's right. Welcome to Congregation Lador Vador and to our newly renovated sanctuary. I am Rabbi Stephen Moskowitz. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first of our community programs. For those joining us online through live stream, Facebook, or YouTube, we welcome you. For those of you who live in the area, we hope you will join us in person one day in our sanctuary. Our programs and our services are open to the community. 
Next Tuesday evening, Tweed Roosevelt will be our guest. We look forward to his conversation with our synagogue's president, Brian Lamb, and learning some inside stories about the Roosevelt family. On Friday evening at 7 p.m., not only will we celebrate Shabbat as we do every week, but services will be followed by a concert featuring Broadway show tunes with our cantor, Talia Smilowitz and Bruce Revald. There are many more programs in the coming weeks and months, including Brett Stevens from the New York Times and Representative Steve Israel and Peter King. Mark your calendars with the date of November 2nd for the next in our economic forum when we will learn about the changing job market. Check out our synagogue's website and Facebook page for more details about these programs. Our synagogue wishes to be a place of learning and uplift, not only for our members, but for the community at large. And because of the blessing of technology, we have also discovered that our teachings, songs, and conversations know no borders. Our board has set a vision for our synagogue that it can indeed reach far beyond these walls and that learning need not be limited to traditional topics. This evening, we are pleased to learn more about some of the monumental changes that are going on in the stock market. In particular, the emergence of trading apps and the prevalence of so many more people buying and selling stocks on their own. We will learn from two experts, Ben Snyder and Andrew Sandler. Andrew will tell us more about Ben but I want to take a few moments to say some words about my friend and this evening's host, Andrew Sandler. Andrew is the managing director of Sandler Capital, which he joined in 1991. He is head of the firm's hedge fund business and has served as portfolio manager for the firm's flagship hedge funds since June of 1997. Andrew and I have known each other for nearly 20 years and celebrated countless occasions and holidays together. Whenever I have a question about the markets or the economy, matters that they don't teach you anything about in rabbinical school, I have always turned to Andrew. And I look forward to learning from him and his guest, Ben Snyder. I know everyone shares my interest in this evening's topic, the new retail versus institutional trading paradigms, one brief reminder, if there, at the end of the evening, if we have time, we'll ask, take some questions from those who are in attendance in person. But please join me in welcoming Ben Snyder and Andrew Sandler. Thank you very, thank you very much, Rabbi. Appreciate that. And thank you very much, Brian. Uh, thank you, Tweed Lebovador. And I would like to welcome Ben Snyder from Goldman Sachs. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank, thank you, Goldman Sachs, too. Ben is um, works for uh, a team at Goldman who I think are some of the smartest guys on Wall Street. Uh, whether it's the economy, whether it's the markets, these guys know the answers. And uh, this particular subject that we're discussing tonight, besides it being a hotbed and uh, um, something that, that, that gets my juices really riled up, Ben is an amazing expert on this subject and studies all the stats on it and so forth. So Ben, thank you. And uh, we'll just get into it, I guess. And, and uh, you know, wh why don't you, lay out for us briefly or at least basically the landscape as you see it whether uh, start with maybe um, what percent retail used to be where is retail with you know in their 401k in their own accounts trading on Robinhood apps etc um, and what percent of the market that has become uh, versus historic. Uh, 
maybe talk a little bit about how big passive investing versus active has also been, and just, just give us a pizza pie framework. Great. Thank you, Andrew. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Rabbi, and the congregation. Very excited to be here. Um, I know we've discussed this a little bit, but I'm excited to hear more of your thoughts as well. But oh, for the my <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> but I'll start with the, some of the basics. I can't promise to be brief. I'm a, yeah, a sure. research analyst after all, so yeah, I have a tendency yeah, to, sure. to go on, but I'm sure you'll direct me in the right sure. direction. So if you look at a historical chart of almost anything in the macro economy, and you include last year in it, basically all of history looks like a flat line, and then there was a spike. Sometimes the spike is up, sometimes the spike is down. But if you were to look at unemployment, you would see that picture. Uh, relative to last year, all of the historical volatility really pales in comparison. And you could draw that same picture with retail or household participation in the equity market. So for years and years and years, the retail share of trading volume was roughly 5%. Sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower, but roughly 5%. And Last year, as the market plummeted, that share rose to north of 20%, and it's still there today. But I think it's really important just at the outset that we draw a distinction between all individual investors and the retail trader. For years, part of what makes the US equity market so special, if you're comparing it with other equity markets around the world, is that the US equity market is really owned by households. This is not the case, for example, in Europe. But in the US, households, you and me, directly own 34% of the equity market. And then another third or so, we own indirectly through mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds, et cetera. And that is a, a massive proportion. But of course, most of those assets are long-term investment capital. They're not being actively traded left and right. And I think part of what's changed so radically in the last 18 months is a, a wealth of participation by folks who in the past really haven't thought much about equity investing. So uh, I might sound a little like Bernie Sanders here, but if you were to break apart the income or wealth distribution of the US household, the top 10% of households by wealth own about 90% of the equity market. And that remainder, that other 10%, uh, historically has been passively invested. And it's only recently that that long-term capital has shifted into uh, what you could call fast money and actively traded capital. And there are some signs that perhaps that's declining a little bit, or it's declined from the peak, which was really earlier this year, but it's still very, very elevated relative to where we were before the pandemic. Ben, tell us a little bit about history and what hist and uh, the, obviously you say history is a, is a line and then there's a spike. Where have been the other times where retail has, um, participated what you, I mean let's go back let's go back to the tulips if you if you want and and take us through other year other years and where this is on that scale sure so uh, first thing I'll note not a superstitious guy but if you look at the biggest and most famous bubbles in history they generally take place in the 20s of a, of a century so we all know what year it is on the calendar just something to bear in mind uh, the first and most famous bubble, perhaps, or at least the first famous bubble, is, of course, tulips. That was the 1630s, so not quite the 20s. Perhaps. Right before, and up right after a pandemic also. That, that's correct. Um, that one, uh, for all of its fame, actually ended pretty nicely, right? I mean, certainly there were investors who were involved in the tulip game and who lost a lot of money, but there's really no evidence that anyone outside of those buying and selling tulips was harmed. But if we jump forward 100 years, we get to the 1720s. Uh, and that was a whole kaleidoscope of bubbles, most famously the South Sea bubble, uh, which bankrupted uh, even famous Isaac Newton. Uh, and that led to 
a larger, broader economic downturn. And that became a characteristic that we see repeatedly through history if you look at other bubbles. Um, of course, we can jump another 100 years to the 1920s. Uh, very famously, that stock market downturn led to the Great Depression. Uh, it's not to say that every bubble ends up in catastrophe. So when I jumped from the 1720s uh, to the 1820s to the 1920s, I jumped over the late 19th century, where, for example, you had the uh, bicycle bubble in the 1890s, not very well known, uh, hard to imagine now, or later in the 1890s, uh, something that will ring a bell with many investors, uh, an electric car bubble, believe it or not. Uh, and it's interesting to see how cycles repeat themselves. Those actually, if you take a long enough historical perspective, were, were favorable because they led to the expansion of manufacturing capacity that persisted even after the bubble was gone. And so all those factories that were built to make bicycles, even after the bicycle bubble died down, could be repurposed for other uses. And uh, that is similar, in a way, to what happened famously in the tech bubble in the late 90s and 2000s. Now, of course, that caused a much larger loss of household wealth and also catalyzed a lot of damage in the labor market that persisted for years and arguably still persists to this day. We really haven't gotten back quite to the levels of employment that we saw in the late 90s. Uh, but there is a silver lining of that bubble where it led to a massive investment in technology and infrastructure that still underlies most of our internet usage today. Today, perhaps we'll look back at this surge in retail trading and find a silver lining. Perhaps it's uh, an eventual use for cryptocurrencies. Um, but in the moment today, it's easy to see some things that look alarming. Uh, it's less easy to see why those might end up being good for the broader economy. So if I can, I'll list some things that look alarming. Yeah, you, why don't we just go into that and, and, and talk about the implications, uh, what you think could happen here. Sure. Uh, so when I think about these broad macroeconomic topics, either as an analyst or as an investor, I think it's extremely useful to have a framework. And fortunately, uh, there's a book published just last year called Boom and Bust by Professor Taylor and Quinn. And they go through all these historic market booms, which you can call bubbles, and they create what I think is a very useful framework for thinking about them. They analogize market booms to fires. And they say a fire needs three things, and they draw you a nice triangle that you can picture in your mind. The first thing is the presence of oxygen. And they describe oxygen in this framework as the ability to trade. Uh, it's very simple. So historically, this is often a new product, for example, a bicycle. Uh, but today, of course, the equity market has been around for a long time. We can argue about things like NFTs and cryptocurrencies, but there's very clearly a retail engagement in the equity market. So what is the oxygen in this case? What's new? Well, I think we can point to a number of things. Uh, and you mentioned earlier apps, and I think the specific example is Robinhood, but it's broader than that, right? In 2019, in October, before anyone had heard of COVID-19, effectively all the retail brokerages cut commissions to zero. So uh, the, the retail investor could feel like it was frictionless and free to trade. There's also the introduction of fractionalized trading. So if I wanna buy a share of Amazon and it's trading at $3,000, I don't have to have $3,000. I can buy as much as I want and just own a share of the stock. And of course, uh, there's something to be said simply for having apps in our pockets where we can trade whenever we want without calling a broker. So uh, that's clearly, I think, the oxygen. But that's been around for a long time. Robinhood's been around since 2013. So, so that brings me to the next leg of the framework, which is fuel. And in their framework, fuel is effectively capital. It's access to money. And historically, this is often credit and ability to take on leverage. We saw that very clearly with margin balances in the late 90s. Uh, but today, I think you can point to the massive amounts of monetary and fiscal stimulus that entered the economy last year. Right, we had the Fed's balance sheet expand from $4 trillion to $8 trillion, so adding $4 trillion into the economy. And of course, we had a similar quantity in fiscal 
stimulus, much of which was direct payments to households and uh, extended unemployment benefits. And so if you look historically, uh, you actually see that last year, despite the massive tragedy of, of human lives and health and the massive damage to the labor market, household incomes across the US actually grew. And household savings hit an unprecedented level. Another one of those charts that looks crazy. Uh, so that's the second life. And then, of course, once you have oxygen and fuel, you need a spark. And the spark, I think, very clearly was the market drawdown combined with the lockdowns of the pandemic. And if you have everyone at home, and there's no sports, and there's no entertainment, and they're either not going to work or they're not working at all, and they have all this cash, well, got to bet on something. Got to bet on something. And even better, everyone all of a sudden got a 30% sale on their stock. Any right. stock they knew about was 30% cheaper than it had been or more. And so you create those together, and you get the last element of the triangle, which is, which is heat. That's the speculation. And so if you're asking kind of what's the, what's the implication of this, um, I think there are two pretty clear things. The first is you have a market that is, you can debate how much, but I think incontroversially dislocated from fundamentals. And that's something that might bother people who are professionally engaged in the market all the time or academics. R really? But, <laughs> but, but that's actually, I'm going to argue, of course I'm a little biased too, but I'm going to argue it's actually relevant to, to everyone in the economy. Right. Uh, and that is because part of what makes our capitalist society so great is the market, and it serves two really important functions. One is it allocates capital to enterprises that are growing and improving the economy, and the second is it allows savers to have productive returns on their savings. And when you dislocate that machine from fundamentals, it works less effectively, and it also uh, destroys confidence in the machine. And that can be a problem. And I think the, the most obvious and, and perhaps most concerning consequence of this is increased volatility. And what I mean by increased volatility is greater cycles of boom and bust. So maybe we're still eventually coming back to fair value, but the amplitude along the way is much more violent. And if you want an example, you can look at the China equity market where I mentioned the US is unique. China is even more unique, if you will. 80% of the China equity market is owned by retail investors, and uh, that's not the only reason they have major boom and bust cycles, but it is a key reason why they have major boom and bust cycles. And we saw, for example, in the late 90s, what can happen uh, when you have an uh, irrational exuberance that then deflates, and in all those other historical bubbles that we mentioned. And if you're thinking about how you can get there, uh, I think Going back to that framework is the answer, right? You either have to remove the oxygen or the fuel or the speculation. And so uh, the oxygen would be to make trading less easy. That's certainly possible. I with would with P PFOF issues and, and, the, and, that, and that kind of regulation, that's a possibility, yes. It's a possibility. I would call it the, probably the least likely possibility. Okay, right? I agree. In, in the late 90s, uh, regulators noticed there was a problem with retail trading, and they started to raise the margin requirements to take on leverage as a retail trader. And you know what? They succeeded, but they succeeded, and the law went effective, or the regulation went effective in September 2001, which was a year and a half after the market peaked, and unfortunately, when prices were already 25% lower than at the market peak. Um, one effective example, by the way, was the Meiji rabbit bubble in Japan uh, in the 19th century. There, the government instituted a rabbit tax and the bubble went away. I think in this environment, we'll probably be a little less effective through that channel. The second is to remove the fuel, remove the, the liquidity in the economy, remove some of the cash. And that actually is a pretty common attribute of past bubbles deflating. Except we have a Fed that, that, that is a little different this time. It's always a little different. It's always a little time, different, yeah. But uh, there's become an expression that's famous in the markets called it's the Fed It's never different. Put. Yeah, yeah, the Fed, Fed put, put, right? Fed put. Oh, which uh, cynics would just say that uh, Fed board members have personal equity investments. If you want to be more charitable, you can say they appreciate the fact that the health of the equity market matters for household wealth and therefore household spending. Right? For those who are unaware, consumer activity 
is 70% of the US economy. And because households own so much of the equity market, if the equity market falls, people feel less wealthy because they are less wealthy, and therefore they spend less, and that can catalyze other economic downturns. Right? We saw that very clearly in 2008 through both the equity market and the housing market. Uh, we saw it in the late 90s. And in both of those environments, actually, those bubbles were, were ended in part because of tightening monetary policy. Now, we can debate at what point the Fed put will be in the money, at what point Jerome Powell and the rest of the Fed will say, enough is enough, we want to support the market. But already, they're clearly moving in the direction of tightening. You know, we have the Fed meeting minutes released today, and there's effectively unanimous agreement across uh, the, the policymakers of monetary policy in this country that it is time to reduce the degree of stimulus that they added to the economy last year. Of course, we can debate whether or not tapering is really matters or not matters, and whether they'll ever get to raise rates or, or et cetera. But Sure. Uh, I mean, I guess something is something as opposed to nothing. Absolutely. And on the margin, I think it's clear, or at least clear to me and clear to most market observers, that the direction policy is moving in yep. is tightening. Right. And likewise on the fiscal side. Yep. Right? Even if um, this, this drama in Washington, D.C. resolves itself in favor of some large fiscal package, it is guaranteed or I should say all but guaranteed, it will be less large than the stimulus last year. And therefore, if you're thinking about growth- And, and come with another trillion dollars of, ta of tax increases to pay for it. That's right. That's so it won't be free, it won't be free. That's correct, that's correct. And, and importantly, if you're thinking about the progression of things, that is a contraction relative to last year. So right. you're, you're removing the fuel to some extent, but the truth is, you know, even if you poll 100 academics or investors, and ask them, what was the cause of the bubble popping in 2000? You will not get a unanimous opinion. Right. And you won't find that uh, if you go back to the 1920s either. You won't, certainly won't find that if you go further back, although it's harder to find people to interview about those bubbles these days. Right. But that is the third leg, the heat to speculation. Right? Right. At some point, that speculative fervor right. disappears, and then prices correct. Right. That, that you said a lot, and, and we have a lot to cover. Um, maybe we can shift gears for a second. Um, I don't think we should get into politics, whether we even know who the, the head of the Fed's going to be. Right? We don't know. Uh, it looked like two of the adults in the room resigned. Um, it looks like to some degree, everybody is afraid to be the guy that causes the causes any crack. It's a it's a social thing, and people would rather have it going up than going down. But you know as well as I know, and I hope the audience know that we are growing in excess of capacity right now. And in any other normal cycle, you would have had significant Fed tightening and rate increases by now if there were different people in in power. Um, or something usually goes out of bounds. A long rate where the Fed can't control, a commodity price, something goes out of bounds. You're so out of balance, um, but we've been relatively in balance. And so you're right, the Fed could do it. Could the capital markets do it themselves? Could they be smart enough? And that's another thing I want to throw at you. Is, is that, could we have a nice soft landing correction? Um, the capital market says this was wrong, this was wrong, this was wrong, these were right, and, and everybody just, things get repriced correctly. Or, or does it have to get nasty? Because sure. it feels like the bubble just keeps getting bigger. I would say there's three, three ways it can, can go, right? Um, it's always possible this time is different, and nothing corrects in any manner. Nothing goes down. Maybe it doesn't go up as quickly as it has been, but nothing goes down. Right. Um, Irving Fisher in 1929, in October, famously said, the market has reached a permanently high plateau. Of course, a month prior, the market had actually peaked, and a year later, uh, we were in the Great Depression. Right. And so, um, 
Not to say it's impossible, but it's, it's never happened before. I'll quote a different great market thinker, uh, Warren Buffett, who also has a, th funny enough, a three-part framework for thinking about speculative bubbles. Uh, and his three parts are, first, there are the innovators, then there are the imitators, and last, there are the idiots. Uh, and it's always hard in the moment to know who is the party buying at the moment, but I think it's very clear it's, it's no longer the innovators. Uh, we can argue who are the idiots, but the point is that the, at the end of the day, someone is going to lose money. And I think there will be a correction, and the debate, and the, the appropriate debate, is how broad will that correction be? Right. Will it just be in GameStop, um, which is trading multiples higher than it ever did well before the pandemic, uh, or will it affect the broader equity market? And there, what's I the answer, Ben? What's the answer? Um, <laughs> my personal view is the market is not broadly in a bubble. And this is a somewhat controversial view. Uh, you know, Jeremy Grantham, who I respect a lot, who accurately called the bubble, the tech bubble, in the late 90s, uh, vociferously goes on every podcast he can these days to say this is the bubble. And there are people who would look at valuation metrics, like the price to earnings multiple or the famous Warren Buffett. Price to sales, now, no one uses earnings anymore. Market cap to GDP. Oh, yeah, that, uh, those, that chart's off the page now. All of these charts <laughs> look the same, right? They go flat and, and off the page. And so it's not hard to find things that look ridiculous. Um, on the other hand, the interest rate environment is also arguably ridiculous in the other direction. And there's a famous acronym that's been floated around the street for years called TINA, which is there is no alternative. And I think that's accurate. If you're a saver today, you can invest in cash and guarantee that you will lose value in real terms because inflation will eat it away. You can buy a treasury for less than 2%, nominal, so it also has negative real yield. What else are you gonna buy? Well, maybe a cryptocurrency, maybe an NFT. I think there's some validity to the idea that low rates are inflating other assets besides equities, but if you're looking for a, an established, relatively healthy asset market, I think the stock market is the one to look at. You know? and, and even though multiples are similar today, or in some cases higher, than they were in the late 90s. If you remember in the late 90s, the 10 year treasury yield was 6%. Today it's less than 2%. That's, that gets into the inbounds versus outbound question. How long can we be in this? How long can prices be up 4 or 5% year over year? I know it's not, we're in a special circumstance. Um, how long can we grow at this rate and still have a 1.5% 10 year? And when do we have responsible Fed that cares about inflation? And so, yeah, I understand um, that on a snapshot, the market can look okay. The question is, you know, snapshot investing is, is difficult. Not, not, it's not a good way to invest. That's right. And I think um, for, for a decade, longer than a decade, since the financial crisis, the the risk that investors have been thinking about, the primary risk, is that all of this stimulus and the low rate policy and quantitative easing will eventually lead to inflation. And inflation breaks this Goldilocks environment that we've all come to know and love, right? If there's no inflation, the, the federal government can spend as much money with the deficit as large as they want, the Fed can keep rates as low as they want, and the market can keep rallying and justifying valuations based on those level of rates. Because the Fed's mandate is stable prices, which means inflation around 2%, and full employment. And if you look at the unemployment rate, there are some who argue we're at full employment, but most economists would say we're not quite there. So the Fed has really no incentive, if inflation is not a problem, to change monetary policy. But all of a sudden, if inflation starts to put pressure, then there's a problem. And then maybe the rate environment changes, and then maybe the justification for owning all these riskier assets and the high valuations starts to decay. And that's been the story of the last several months. We see inflation now that's higher than it's been in many cases since the 1970s. Um, some of this you can attribute to 
what the Fed would call transitory factors, to use a controversial term. Very controversial. Very controversial term. But, uh, for example, it's, it's, I think, uncontroversial that there are factories in East Asia that are closed, closed because right. of virus of restrictions. At some point, they will reopen. Right. That will help supply chains normalize, and right. et cetera, et cetera. However, it's not just price inflation that's running at the highest rate since the 1970s. It's also wage inflation. Yep. And that can be a more sustainable cycle. In fact, what we saw in the 1970s, which was famously an environment of stagflation, that is stagnant growth and high inflation, which is the worst possible environment. Terrible, for, terrible for, for multiples. That would rate. absolutely destroy the stock market. Exactly. And so that's the risk. And, and we actually just wrote a report on this last weekend. But if you look at the market in those years relative to today, you have lower valuations. And it's not just valuations. It's not just this idea of sentiment and risk appetite. You have lower corporate earnings. It's hard for companies to make a profit when they're getting squeezed on input costs, right. including wages, energy costs, supply chains. Stuff, not, stuff goes out of bounds. Stuff goes out of bounds. And so I would say the, the key debate, we have many debates with investors and even internally yep. on our team, but the biggest debate by far is how long will inflation remain at these elevated levels? And you know, the Fed is continuing to maintain the view that by this time next year, inflation will have declined pretty dramatically. You have very respected thinkers like Larry Summers who take the other side of that view. I mean, at some p point, there's a basing effect where prices can stay and just a year over year changes and you're back to normal 2 3%, but prices didn't come down. And for the Fed, well, so certainly. I mean, They're hoping for that. I think, I think it's a very important to differentiate between the idea that inflation comes down and that prices come down. Right. Inflation is a rate of change. Right. So if all prices stay where they are today, inflation will go to zero. Right. The prices won't come down. Right. I think there are some places where it seems very likely prices will come down. For example, used cars. Yep. Right? As we have more cars come to the market, yep. it's irrational to keep paying higher prices for used cars. Yep. But wages, it's not clear whether that will revert. You know, I, we just saw uh, last week a pretty disappointing job growth report. People don't want to work. People don't want to work. Why? Is it because they're making money in stocks and crypto and, 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 and they'd rather be at home? What, what, what changed? So it's a great question. And, and the truth is, we don't really know yet because it's, we're still in the middle of it. But I think there are some things that we can feel pretty confident about. So one is, and there's very clear survey data that tell you, people are still worried about the virus. And there are people who don't want to go back to their old job because they're afraid of getting sick. Now, that fear has declined dramatically, right. and it's likely to decline even further given the advances we've seen in some therapeutics that are right. now waiting for sure. people. There's also uh, these extraordinarily generous supplemental unemployment benefits. Those expired in early September. St I still here, you can't hire, still. Still, thought, I thought that would help, still here in problems. So um, I think many economists, ourselves included, were surprised that you didn't see larger growth of employment in September, given that those supplemental benefits expired the first week of September. Maybe they're just trading Shiba Shu and Polka Dodi Polka -do and making more money. I think it's not, <laughs> it's not, the, here, I'll put it in the economic context. That's the wealth effect again. Yeah. Right? If you've become wealthier, even if it's on paper, digital paper, um, you are less incentivized to go make wage income. And savings rates are still extremely elevated relative to where they've been historically. Uh, and so there's less of that incentive. So in a nutshell, can the capital markets correct this by themselves or do they need help from the Fed or, or something to go out of bounds? That's really what this comes down to. Otherwise, if you believe it has to be one of the two, you just keep blowing the balloon, and it just keeps going. I, it, it, but I know that something has to go, I mean, the balloon pops. The balloon pops. The balloon pops at the end. Absolutely. I, I think From can, one way or another. Um, I'll, I'll quote my last 20th century economist, Hyman Minsky, who famously said that stability breeds instability. And so if you were to take a very charitable view of the world today and say, actually, there is no bubble, 
inflation's not going to be a problem, the Fed's not going to be a problem, everything is fine. What he would tell you is, well, in that case, you're going to encourage more risk taking. Because if people look at the appreciation in prices that's occurred and realize there's nothing stopping it, they'll take even more risk. And eventually, you will create a bubble. And so I think this is, to, this is what's happening now, no? If you want to be an optimist, the argument is not there is no bubble. That's, a, I think, a pretty untenable position at this point. The argument is there is a bubble, but it's going to keep inflating, and I'm going to ride it on the way out. Uh, that is a very dicey proposition to embrace. But to your point, there are many who are embracing it. Yeah. I mentioned that retail trading volumes are now running 3x where they were for years and years pre-COVID. Also running 3x where it was for years and years pre-COVID is call option volumes, which are, in effect, leverage bets that prices will go up. I was taught that you buy when there's blood in the street, when nobody wants to buy equities, when you, when you write death of equities, uh, everybody's scared. This is exactly the, the opposite. Um, everybody can't find the reason for this to stop. If you want to find a great predictor of long-term equity returns, not the investment horizon that will be relevant to, to most of us professionally, but if you're, a, say, a pension fund or just a, a person thinking about how much to invest in equities over the next decade, the best indicator, or one of the best indicators you can find, is the share of equities in household portfolios. And very simply, when people don't own equities, they're going to eventually buy more, and that means returns will be great. And conversely, when people own a lot of equities relative to their other assets, eventually things tend to normalize, and that creates selling pressure over time that is not great for prices. Well, today, household allocations to equities are close to 50%. Depending on the week, the only time they've really been higher was at the peak of the tech bubble. And so, exactly to your point. So we're right, and before that, historically, has it gotten above the 50 number? Is it we don't have great data in the 20s, the 1920s, but based on other proxies, for example, price to earnings multiples, yeah. you can argue that it got slightly higher even then. Okay, that's uh, interesting stuff. And, and, and uh, I'd like to just weave now to the general, to the, the really insane. You okay with this? Absolutely. I'm, I just want to make sure that there's a security guard around. Um, some of these retail traders, the Reddit people, the Wall Street bets, the AMC apes, they even have a different philosophy. They literally believe in wealth transfer and look for short squeezes and force institutions to go bankrupt. That's what they want to do. And they think they deserve it. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, an incredible uh, thing that, that these people that, that had never had anything before think the hedge fund industry is going bankrupt. They think Citadel is going bankrupt. They have an evil empire, the Dark Poles. They have Darth Vader. They, they have a comic book story. And they all believe it. it it's, it's probably the biggest, and I'll say the word, it's the biggest cult I have ever seen. Four million plus people, something like that. Their strategy is to go after shorted companies. Now, I grew up in a world where the shorts were the smartest guys in the, world, in the room. They, they, you would never want to bet against a short. Well, why why, they, why the guy, tell me why the guy's short? Let's find out the story. They have exactly the opposite view, which is, again, the rubbernecking, looking up, not looking down at risk. Um, so I guess I want to hand it to you, basically, and, 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 and for you to either describe it either better than me or um, how, how, how you think this particular 
class plays out and um, if they lose money, is there going to be a revolution? Like, I, I, I mean, these, these people, some of these people are violent. I'm, I'm on the forums as a, you know, doing my research. You know, I got I to know what I'm going up against. And there's not one of them that you can convince that they're wrong. Not one. The arrogance and greed, and they don't think their stock is just going up or their crypto. They don't even think it's stopping at the space station. It's going right to the moon. To the moon. It's also another rubber neck up. So with that, I'm just gonna look I keep talking about it. I'm gonna get I am gonna get riled up. <laughs> I'll try and I'll yeah. give you a few minutes to yeah. catch your breath. So uh, I think this is a great example of how market dynamics that begin in a contained fashion can break out of that containment and cause for lack of a better word, contagion elsewhere. Uh, and to your point, there are now 25,000 comments a day in the Reddit online message board devoted to one stock, GameStop. That ranks it in the top 10 of, of the online message board. So just to give you a sense of this, this fervor. And I think it's starting from a somewhat reasonable place as much of the current global populism has. Right? It, there's, there's a reason why these roots have taken hold. And uh, I mentioned earlier that the, the top 10% of households own 90% of the equity market. Um, and there's a feeling that, that things aren't fair. And we've seen a, a wealth of academic literature in the last decade showing that the returns on capital are much greater than the returns on wages. So if you're rich and invest, you're going to be better off in 10 years than someone who works very hard. And that can be a bitter pill to swallow if you're working very hard and not rich. And so it starts in a reasonable place. Um, but unfortunately, it has taken on an almost religious fervor. And it's, I think, another example of how we're seeing tribalism and partisanship expand into more and more areas in our, in our lives. And so you start to see now, even politicians opine on these market events, which I don't think it's too controversial to say were not really viewed as political issues five or 10 years ago. Now they're being viewed as political issues. Uh, and, and that's one way that these containments can break and they can create problems. Because if, if they become political enough, they can actually lead to legislation and regulation that can affect the broader market. Right. Another way is... But usually they get to them after the, the crack happens and they start blaming people. Of course. That, that's the history. Of course. Uh, like I said, in 2000, it took a year and a half before you put the Band-Aid on after the patient had already bled out pretty dramatically. Right, right. Uh, the, the other way it can cause ripple effects is, as you discussed, through short interest. And this is a great example of what I was mentioning earlier where the market becomes slightly less efficient. I mean, shorting is a way that prices of assets reflect their fundamental reality. Uh, if things can only ever go up, it's very hard to have a market where prices accurately reflect fundamentals. And so there's a balance between people buying and selling. Um, if you look historically, another one of these charts, this one is flat and goes down. For years and years and years, the typical S&P 500 stock, you know, the 500 largest companies that most of us focus on most of the time, the typical stock had short interest about two or three percent of its market cap. Today, that is close to one percent. And that is the lowest ever, except for the very peak of the tech bubble in 2000. That's also not a good sign for the it's market. It's not a good sign. And the reason we got there is because of investors who saw the unpredictability and the fanaticism of retail investors looking for short positions as opportunities to squeeze. And so investors who, like you said, are often very smart and doing a lot of good fundamental research said, this company in a normal market, I might want to short it. But today, the odds are stacked against me because of the unpredictable retail trader, and I'm going to back off. I actually think the odds are higher now, but that's my own opinion. The odds are, excuse me. The odds are, are, are now in our favor. I think that's right. I think the timing is, is the hard part. And of course, and Time, timing is everything. As they say, you know, the, the, the market can remain rational longer than you can remain solvent. Yes. So if you get the view right, I, I, I 
uh, praised Jeremy Grantham earlier. He was indeed right about the tech bubble. Unfortunately, he was too early in his correct view and effectively lost all of his funds assets in the late 90s as the market continued to appreciate up, and he yeah. was saying this is ridiculous. Now, right. over the long run, he gained them back. Right. But it shows that the, it's not just the direction you have to identify, but it's the timing. Yeah, sure. And that's a very difficult task. Yeah. Um, I've sent you many videos. Um, I watch 20 videos a day. YouTubers who cater to this group and every single one of the videos are full of certainly misleading things I, and I'm going to say in certain cases fraud, literally fraud that they're, that they're selling these retail people. Stuff like BlackRock and Vanguard are, are in because they know that there's a short squeeze. And you know it's because they are, it's in the index fund. They have to own it. Uh, stuff like Citadel's going bankrupt and you, um, their performance is just fine. Um, things like, oh, the stocks have a negative beta, so when the market goes down, these are going to go up. And you know that was just the January thing that affected it. And as the biggest names in the Russell, they're going to go down. They lied to these people. I know there's a freedom of speech issue, but certainly the, the, there needs to be some regulatory issues here. And by the way, each one of these YouTubers are collecting advertising it's by financial, by, by financial, you know, Webull or some other platform. So I just wanted to, you know, hear your thoughts on that and, and, and whether you think the, the SEC is going to, there's another agency that we didn't even talk about yet. Could they do something here um, and hurt this thing? I think if we look back in five or ten years, I think there will be some changes in, let's call it media regulation along these lines. You know, I, I think you're right. This is in large part a commercial endeavor for these people. Perhaps that's also part of the reason why job growth has not been great. Uh, people realize you can make a lot of money on TikTok and YouTube and Twitch. Selling people a story. Selling people a story that will spark emotion, just like a lot of the cable news does. Yeah. Okay, sure. Right? And, and the problem is uh, its connection to the asset market, and that's usually where the regulators step in. Um, there's been some suggestion that regulators are thinking about these things. Yeah. Um, but it's often hard to draw these lines, and when something becomes widespread enough and is growing quickly enough, it's hard for regulators to react quickly enough to solve the problem before it reaches critical mass, as we've seen in the past. Right. So I think that's that's part of the issue. Right. But but you're right. I mean, it's um, it's almost laughable if it weren't having such a material impact on real markets and real activity. Um, you know, it's, it's, again, I use the word religious. I don't know a better way to describe it. Cult is, a, is maybe a better way. To oh, I, I, I went, looked up the definition of cult, and with the exception of the religion part, it 100% described it. Uh, and, and you can plug in religion for, or for greed and money, and, 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 and then you got yourself the definition. Right. I mean, religion obviously has some positive context, too, right. as right. our surroundings right. would evident. But... But it's the idea, the, the difference between that and a cult is, is I think, the, the absence of the aim for the greater good, or even for the good of the participants in the, in the, the tribe or the collective. Right? Right. So um, if you watch these videos, as I know we both do, you hear references to MOAS. Dark holes, MOAS. The yeah, mother sure. of all short squeezes. Yeah. And it's yeah. viewed as an apocalyptic day of judgment that yeah. will certainly be coming in the future. Right. And it, it sounds like a, you know, like a, a preacher in, in the 19th century trying to raise money selling. For, for all of you that don't know what MOAS stands for, it's the, called, it's the mother of all short squeezes. That's their term. Right. And the idea is... Stock day, prices are going to trade to... To five thousand, even if it's even if they're really worth ten, it doesn't matter, because the shorts have to come. But yeah, yes, these yeah. evil companies, these evil investment uh, managers, shorting the market yep. will go out of business. Yes, and 
the TikTok and Reddit investors will become massively wealthy. Yes, a, a whole tra Robin Hood, a, a Robin Hood transfer of money. Right. So, you know that that's the the third leg of the the triangle uh, in the Turner and Quinn model is is the speculative heat, and that is the one thing that is always in common about the end of these bubbles, right? You, you never see a bubble deflate even though everyone still wants to buy something. Um, there's a saying, there's, there's nothing like price to change sentiment, and so sometimes it can take a little bit of a downturn in an asset before people lose confidence, but it's always that disruption of confidence that leads to the decay. And then you just need to figure out what changes the confidence. Right, right. Whether it's regulatory, whether it's the Fed, whether it's something we're not even thinking about. So you could tell a relatively simple economic story where this persists for long enough that uh, the excess wealth created last year normalizes and people have to uh, go get a job <laughs> or, or just realize that, that owning GameStop as it tried, trades sideways for months and months is actually not going to make you wealthy and you need to do something else. So that is, I think, which a, then in itself causes the stock to then exactly. continue to go down, which causes more people to lose money, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not as dramatic as being able to identify a date on the calendar. Right. It's a little more gradual. Change. It's more gradual, but I think you can tell a story, a pretty intuitive story, where that's what happens, right? If you're waiting forever for the judgment day, right, and it's not coming, right, eventually you stop waiting. And they and these and these YouTubers and they have judgment days every every week, every week, right. for some rule change and. I, some of these things, I, I, I used to call my, I call my, my uh, trader, I'm like, Eric, you know about this rule change? And he goes, let me, hold on, let me go call our guy. And he, he called me back, it's nothing, forget about it, it's irrelevant. But they'll make 50 videos about it. Of course, of course. Yeah, but to your point, a lot of it is... Or you can't borrow the stock. It's, uh, uh, can, can, I, how, can, I buy a, can I borrow a million AMC? Yeah, 1%, done. Another, uh, keep lying to people. It, it's, it's, a, it's a continuous discovery of the one thing that is going to change everything. Right. And this too can only happen so many times. Now, I can't tell you exactly how many times that is, but there is certainly a finite number of times that can happen before people lose faith. Right. And in my, if I had to, to, to guess, to throw a dart, that's probably the most likely way that this ends. Attrition. Attrition. And the, the hope is that the attrition occurs sufficiently distanced from any change in monetary policy or the economic growth environment that as those investors sell and leave the market, there is still appetite among longer term, more fundamental investors to own equities. And therefore, you don't have a widespread crash. You just have a return to normalcy for these smaller pockets of the market. Yeah, that's the, that's the nice version. That's the nice version. Now, unfortunately, it's not just households who have extremely elevated allocations to equities. If you look at US equity mutual funds, their cash positions small. are not just small, the smallest they've been in our data history, which is 20 or 30 years. Also not good. Not good. And if you look at hedge fund leverage, it's not the highest it's ever been because it's declined a little bit in the last couple months. But if you look over the last five or 10 or 15 years, you need a binoculars to see that it's not the highest it's ever been. It still looks very high on a longer term basis. And so that's the concern, is it's not just the retail investor. Maybe some of that, again, is justifiable because of the monetary policy environment. By the way, it's been the right call right. over the this last year, five year, 10 years to be right. very long equities. So right. you've taught investors, some of whom have only been trading in the last five or 10 years. These people have never seen a down market. Exactly. And they, they almost saw one last year, and it ended up being the fastest market rebound we've ever seen. And so it just reinforced the lesson that the Fed, Jerome Powell will have your back. Don't ever sell. If anything, keep buying the dip. And it's going, I think, to, to take a, chain, a real fundamental change in the economic environment to change that mindset. As we were discussing earlier. Do we, need to do we need to have an earnings down? Do we need to have a traditional tightening, people see the earnings trajectory downward to spiral that, or could something else spiral that? You're right. Traditionally, that's been the case. 
Um, usually the way economic and market downturns work is growth gets bad, earnings get bad, people realize they shouldn't be paying the same price for something that is earning less money and they sell it and that feeds on itself. Uh, there are certainly those who look at what is happening in the economy and with, with supply chains and with the weaker than expected job growth and they look into next year and they say, growth might be pretty weak next year in terms of the broad economic picture and especially in terms of the corporate picture. But I think y this, at, at the risk of saying this time is different, I think the market is so dependent today on monetary policy, on the Fed, that you could imagine the market deflating even without any change in earnings if there's sufficient pressure from inflation or some other factor on the Fed. Like oil or something goes, something goes out of bounds. I think that's right. right. Now, because of the way the macro economy works, it would be pretty unusual to have that happen in isolation. Right? So what's concerning many investors today is you have oil price spikes and that leads to uh, factory production slowdown and that exacerbates the supply chain issues which puts pressure on inflation and corporate profit margins. And so you get both the inflation and the growth story happening together. And if I were to tell a very bearish story about the market looking forward, it would be all those dynamics just getting worse and worse. Right. Now, the, the positive story, you said the time to buy is when there's blood on the streets and no one wants to buy. If you want to be a bull, you look at something like option skew, which tells you the cost of buying downside protection in options is extremely, extremely high today. That is, it's not only us who are aware there are problems in the market and vulnerabilities. Many, many people are aware of this. And even though they're very long, they're also aware. And you can look at sentiment surveys like the AAII survey, where the share of people who categorize themselves as bearish today is also very elevated. Now, that's not what their portfolios are saying, but it's what they're saying to the survey. Uh, and so you can find some signs of concern that might tell you the market isn't purely irrational and over its skis. Um, but I think it's fair to say, on average, multiples are expensive, people are long, and that tends to skew the distribution of potential outcomes in an unfavorable direction. Thank you. That's, it was well said. How are we on time, Rabbi? Five minutes? Um, Maybe we should talk a little bit uh, crypto. I don't, I don't know how, whether you, you're, you feel up to as an expert on crypto, but maybe to me it's, it's, it's I get it, it's an asset allocation decision based on there's nowhere else to put money and I, I get it. On the other hand, I think half of the cryptos won't even be, won't exist in, in the next five years. And there's no use for them. And it's all based on, the, it's all the same people, by the way. They all, the AMC and the GameStop guys own Shiba Chu and Polka Dot. And so, so, so to me, it's just, it's just the same disease through the whole system. $2.2 trillion crypto market. If that, if that breaks at the same time as the overall market too, that's gonna hurt people too. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on whether, whether you know, does, does it start there? Does it end there? Where, 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 where do you think that that falls into this, in this puzzle? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, look, I have a personal investment philosophy, which is that I want to own assets that have a inherent value that is generally predicated on cash flows, not always, but has an inherent value. Um, so for example, I, even though m most asset allocators in the world would disagree with me, I don't have a place for gold in my portfolio. Uh, you know, Warren Buffett talks about how it doesn't generate any cash. Yeah. I have the same view. Right. You can make an argument that there are some cryptocurrencies that can serve a function like gold, and there will be stores of value, and there will be good things to own. As because your kids may be kidnapped, and you may need it to pay for them to get them back. This is a separate issue. How do you use it is a separate question. But to be fair, most people who own the gold aren't doing anything with the gold That's either, true. Right? Keeping it in their, in their safe. Okay. You can keep your Bitcoin in your digital safe. Yeah, okay. 
I think there are two things that raise red flags for me. The first is, there are very, I completely agree with you with the risk of group thing. There are clearly parts of the cryptocurrency universe that are um, less justifiable, should I say. Uh, Shiba coin is a great one. It has a market cap of, I believe, $30 billion. That makes it more valuable than Delta Airlines or Kellogg or any, any number of widely... Doji is also right in there, that $20, $30 billion, $40 billion yeah, number. Yeah, Do Dogecoin is the one. Is the one. Yeah. So, um, that was even created explicitly as a joke. Right. Um, and so there's, of course, ways these things can be self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If enough people view it as a valuable asset, it becomes a valuable asset, but it's really predicated on that uh, quote-unquote greater fool theory, right? That at, at, at some point there will be someone willing to buy it from you at a greater price. Other than that, there's no reason to buy it. Then there are things like Ethereum, which actually have practical uses. Their platform is built on them. And, and I do think we'll look back and, and realize that some of these are bubbles and some of them are actually the foundations for uh, future technology that are widely adopted. Even in 2000, when they broke, some of those companies came back and, and, and they were right. They were just too early or so forth. So th and, that could happen. And the problem is, um, exactly what you said, which is many of the same people own those as own other assets. And um, commodities are another great analogy. I mentioned gold, but broadly for years and years, commodities were uncorrelated with assets like equities and bonds. Ah, they're one trade now, right? And uh, <laughs> at Goldman Sachs, slightly before my time, but at Goldman Sachs we said, hey, you should turn these into an asset, trade the futures, it's uncorrelated, it'll be a great part of your portfolio. That was true for a while, and then the problem is when the same people own all the assets and they suffer from the same psychological swings, they sell all their assets or buy all their assets together and they become correlated. And I think you'll see a very similar thing, even if in theory cryptocurrency, cryptocurrencies should not be correlated, they will end up correlated. Uh, and, and like you said, they can be valuable over the long term, but still trade at the wrong price today. And I certainly think there are parts of the market where that Great. I, I thank you, Ben. I was, that was terrific. My pleasure. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, everybody, Thanks. for your attendance. I uh, hope that was informative, and, and uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>